You're watching The Daily Climate Show. Britain's climate reputation is at stake as a public inquiry into plans for the UK's first deep coal mine in 30 years opens. British Airways reveals its plans for the future of flying. But are measures like sustainable fuel credits enough to sufficiently reduce emissions? And are cities ready for the effects of climate change? In today's daily debate, we ask how where we live will need to change as extreme weather events become more common. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and challenge those coming up with the solutions. And we're starting today at our data dashboard because it shows the impacts that we're having on our planet. Now, this number here is how much the world has warmed since the Industrial Revolution. And as you can see, it's rising fast. Now, that's because we keep burning things, which produces greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, in the process. So if we're going to limit global warming and avoid the worst impacts of the climate crisis, burning things like coal is going to have to stop. But despite having a target of reaching net zero emissions by 2050, the UK government is facing criticism for not stepping in to stop plans for a new coal mine in Cumbria. Now, today, an inquiry into that application opened. So let's take a look at the process so far. Well, four years ago, West Cumbria Mining Company applied for permission for a new deep coal mine near Whitehaven. Now, they say that the project will create more than 500 well-paid jobs at the mine and a further 1,000 in the supply chain. Between 2019 and 2020, local authorities approved the plans on three separate occasions due to changes made to the initial application, although Cumbria County Council subsequently withdrew its support for the mine. Then in December 2020, the Climate Change Committee, which advises the government, released a report saying the UK must move away from using coal in steel production within the next few years if the country intends to meet its legal target of reaching net zero emissions by 2050. Well, initially, the government defended the decision to allow the coal mine, describing it as a local issue. But then in March, the community secretary, Robert Jenrick, decided to review the application. And that, in turn, led to the public inquiry, which opened today. Well, our climate correspondent, Hannah Thomas-Peter, joins me now. So, Hannah, if this mine does get approval, does that risk compromising the government's climate credentials? Well, potentially, I've heard from a very senior person who advises the government on climate change matters, who described the potential approval of a coal mine in Cumbria as just the latest in a series of PR blunders. There was a real sort of gnashing of teeth about how have we found ourselves with all of the legitimate work that the British government is doing uh, to advance the cause of tackling the climate crisis, host of COP26 climate change summit in uh, Glasgow later this year. How can the government find itself in a place where it, it, what is meeting the headlines, what is going to the top of the agenda is the extraction of fossil fuels in UK territory, not just the Cumbrian coal mine, but of course the ongoing approval of new, new licences to drill for oil uh, in the North Sea. Now look, there are a, several, there are a whole range of, of concerns. The first one is of course a practical one. Um, campaigners and indeed scientists and advisors say that if the Cumbrian coal mine was to be um, approved, it would certainly make it harder for the UK to meet its net zero obligations. And it certainly will not help the rest of the world uh, to do the same. This is what the uh, chairman of the Climate Change Committee, Lord Debert, had to say. This is wholly contrary both to the advice we have given and to the fundamental issue of the budgets to which Parliament has signed up and which are now law. So this is contrary, in our view, to the law. Now, the government's position is, well, this is a local planning matter. We can't really get involved. That's not appropriate. Uh, that's the position they're trying to defend. This is what uh, the Prime Minister's spokesperson on COP26, Allegra, Allegra Stratton, had to say earlier today. 
It isn't appropriate for me to comment on um, the Cumbria coal mine. Uh, it's now with the planning inspector and I, and I can't comment either way. But what I can say is that the UK has made brilliant progress in eliminating, uh, getting very close to eliminating coal from its power generation. We will be removing coal from our power generation in 2024. That is a year earlier than we, we had planned. So we've brought that forward. Now, yes, the government has to balance the very real needs of local communities who are interested, of course, in those short term jobs. But the much broader concern is that the UK is risking its moral authority on climate change at the very moment where it needs to be marshalling the momentum of the international community and asking people not to approve more fossil fuel product projects while simultaneously on its own soil, in its own waters, considering doing exactly that. Hannah, thanks very much. And a reminder that you can read more about this and all the other climate stories of the day on our website. Just head to skynews.com slash climate. In today's other climate news, Europe had its warmest summer on record this year, the latest milestone in a trend of rising temperatures. The average surface air temperature in June and August was close to one degree Celsius above the 1991 to 2020 average. The previous warmest summers in 2010 and 2018 were 0.1 degrees cooler. The Environment Agency is allowing wastewater treatment works to release untreated sewage if they're experiencing supply chain disruption to their chemicals. Usually a permit is required, which is subject to strict compliance rules. A government spokesperson said that the action is strictly time limited and there are robust conditions in place to mitigate risks to the environment. The world's three main Christian leaders have issued an unprecedented joint appeal to members of their churches to listen to the cry of the earth. Pope Francis, Archbishop Justin Welby and Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew released a joint statement urging everyone to play their part in protecting the planet. Together they represent more than 1.6 billion Christians around the world. Some warm-blooded animals are having to shape-shift to adapt to the warming climate. That's according to researchers who reported animals are getting larger beaks, legs and ears to better regulate their body temperatures. The report says this is particularly common in birds, but it's not clear whether all animals are capable of adapting to increasing global temperatures. And football clubs across the UK have launched a campaign to fight climate change. Cup 26 kicks off today with fans able to score goals online by making climate conscious decisions such as eating plant based meals or cycling or walking to work and school. Premier League teams will be playing a, in a tournament in the run up to the Climate Summit COP26 with the ultimate goal being to raise awareness of climate change. Now, US President Joe Biden is visiting communities that were hit by flooding and tornadoes last week. At least 50 people were killed in six states after record rainfall in the wake of Hurricane Ida. The president has proposed a trillion dollar infrastructure bill to modernize roads, bridges, sewers and drainage systems in an effort to protect people from extreme weather events, which are expected to become more frequent due to climate change. For decades, uh, scientists have warned of extreme weather uh, would be more extreme and climate change was here and we're living through it now. We don't have any more time. And we'll be discussing how cities need to adapt to deal with the effects of climate change later in the programme. I'm going to be joined by podcast host Mariam Pasha and White House climate advisor Jerome Foster for today's Daily Climate Show debate. Now, flying is responsible for around 2.5% of global carbon dioxide emissions, and the aviation sector is one of the fastest growing sources of greenhouse gases. So finding solutions to reduce the climate impact of how we travel is a key focus for the industry. Well, today, British Airways announced a new sustainability programme, including plans to use more sustainable fuel. Our business correspondent, Paul Kelso, was at that launch. British Airways, along with every other airline, has got a problem. How do you sustain an industry entirely reliant on burning fossil fuels that are incompatible with global climate targets? Well, today we started to get 
part of the answer. We've got a slogan, be a better world, and a one-off livery on this Airbus here, and some commitments long on ambition, if a little short on detail. BA will rely on further carbon offsetting, developing sustainable aviation fuel, as well as hydrogen flight and carbon capture technology to hit a target of net zero by 2050. Now, even if they're successful, they'll still be emitting around 40% of today's CO2 levels. Despite this, Chief Executive Sean Doyle told me there is a sustainable future for his airline and for mass passenger flight in general in a net zero world. The airline industry is very aware of the challenges it faces in relation to sustainability, but we do have solutions. We've got new investment in technologies, we've got new forms of fuel, new forms of propulsion, and we're also investing significantly in carbon offsetting. But, you know, travel is a hugely important part of the way we live our lives. It's very important to the global economy, it's very important to tourism. We're a global community. We are an industry that will need longer to find a sustainable pathway, but we will find one. And many of the technologies British Airways is relying on are unproven on a mass scale. And the challenge of hitting net zero has been piled on top of the problems of the pandemic. Entire fleets grounded, thousands of jobs lost and business models destroyed. And it will have escaped no one at BA or elsewhere that their best ever performance in climate terms has come in the last year when they've barely flown. And finally, Lewis Pugh, the UN patron of the oceans, has completed a 7.8-kilometre swim in Greenland's Ilulissat Ice Fjord. He tackled waters clogged with pieces of ice to highlight the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. Lewis Pugh has called for 30% of the world's oceans to be protected by 2030, completing swims in the Arctic, Antarctic and the English Channel. Do stay with us. Coming up after the break, I'm going to be joined by the host of the Climate Curious podcast, Marian Pasha, and the White House Climate Advisor, Jerome Foster, who is standing by right now, ready and waiting. We're going to be discussing if cities are ready for the effects of climate change after last week's devastating floods in the United States. Plus, will we all need to stop flying to save the planet? That's all coming up next. I think a lot of the time people get worried that I'm taking the mick and that I'm poking fun. But actually, I see it the other way. When I was going through my own anorexia, it was kind of isolating that people stopped laughing with me. They stopped playing pranks. They stopped mucking about. And actually, humour has a brilliant way of bringing people together. It's not always about drawing people apart. So I think that can be used to build people's confidence, their communication and that connection with other people. Because we always see that people tend to get quite lonely when they have mental health problems problems especially eating disorders so actually using this it can help combat that but also provide a platform for them to quite literally stand up for themselves there's always a danger of offending people and I think it's a really good point and that's something that I look at in the course there's a couple of things you've got to think of when you're uh you know writing a joke firstly it's what's your relationship to that topic secondly are you punching up or punching down so are you critiquing people in power or are you bullying those who have less power below you and also what is your ownership of that topic so for example if I talked about being a Canadian single mother you'd think well what's he know and quite rightly I know nothing whereas if Catherine Ryan does then that comes from a place of knowledge and experience so that's something that we do cover in the course it's six weeks, uh, an hour per week, plus homework in between. And we have just been given a wonderful grant by the British Academy to do this throughout the United Kingdom. So we're looking for anyone who's over 18 who has history of an eating disorder and all types of eating disorder. And whether that's diagnosed or undiagnosed, and all you need is uh, Wi-Fi and it's all done interactively via Zoom and it uses peer support. So you get to know people. And we've done a couple of tests and in the tests, uh, people have set up WhatsApp groups. They've ended up going and meeting other people. A couple have even gone on to do a couple of five minute spots. So it's one hour per week over six weeks to teach you comedy as a method of dealing with whatever life throws at you. But in this specific instance, especially for people with eating disorders. Please have been firing tear gas and rubber bullets. I'm Siobhan Robbins, Sky Southeast Asia correspondent in Bangkok.
it's estimated that around 70% of our coastlines are experiencing increased erosion. We start with a steel structure that we put into the seafloor. We then pass a, a very small electrical current between what we call an anode and the, and the cathode, and the structure itself is the cathode. Did you know if more of us walked, rode bikes and scooters to school, we would make a big difference to the air pollution around our school? Yeah, like us. Wednesday will be another fine day for many parts, but heavy thundery showers spreading into the southwest will affect Devon, Cornwall, parts of Wales, parts of Ireland too. Through the course of the day, those will push a little further north and east. Uh, but northeastern parts of the country should have another fine day again with very high temperatures for the time of year. In terms of air pollution, though, we're looking at uh, low levels right across the country, but some moderate pockets across parts of England and Wales, and some of those creeping their way up into parts of Scotland too. The Air Quality Report, sponsored by Philips Air Purifiers. Hello and welcome back to the Daily Climate Show on Sky News. Now we're getting straight to discussing the climate issues of the day now and challenging the solutions to them too with the host of the Climate Curious podcast, Marion Pasha and Jerome Foster, an activist and climate advisor to President Joe Biden. So good evening to both of you. Really good to see you both. Thanks for joining us. So we're starting today by looking at the impacts of climate change on our cities. Now the past few weeks have demonstrated that our planet is in crisis with extreme weather events affecting countries around the world. Now, last week, Storm Ida caused devastation in parts of the United States, including flash flooding in New York. Now, Jerome, that's where you are now. And I understand that New York subway flooded three times this summer. I mean, that's evidence that America is just not equipped to, to deal with extreme weather events, is it? So you're a White House advisor. What are you telling President Biden to do about it? Absolutely. This is a a clear example of how America doesn't have enough investment in infrastructure to protect us from the climate crisis. And the short-term answer to make sure that we are, are, are not long-term impacted by Hurricane Irma is to get immediate assistance to those that are impacted. The long-term answer is to create a civilian climate core in America, to employ people that will go door to door and make sure people have access to um, climate justice um, resources and make sure that they're able to, to be rescued and, and employed after this. So there's so many things we, we need to do, but not enough is being done right now. And what about the UK, Mariam? I'm actually going to take a look at something that the Climate Change Committee said in a report this year. They're advisors to the government, of course. They have said the UK doesn't yet have a vision for successful adaptation to climate change. So, Mariam, it looks like we're not terribly well prepared here either. What, what do you think? Absolutely. I mean, in that report, they looked at 34 priority areas, I believe, and we haven't made significant progress on any of them. And so I think that adaptation is not something that, you know, people who are not immersed in the climate conversation every day maybe have thought about, but it is something that our governments have known we need to do. And action has been, has been short, you know, has been slow and now might be too late for some people. Well, yes. And Jerome, why do you think this is? I've noticed that there have been calls this week to make sure that adaptation, that is things like building flood defences and, and adapting to a changing climate, should have equal priority at COP26, at the UN Climate Summit. Um, at the moment, there's been a lot of talk about getting emissions down. But do you think that that's come at the expense of a focus on adaptation? Well, I think that the conversation should be both and. It should be one focusing on future emissions, but also making sure that we're holding them accountable by seeing real investment year over year. We need to make sure that every, every year we're seeing actual tangible change and not pretty words that often fall empty in communities like how we're seeing in, in New York City right now are reeling from because of the empty promises that happened in the 2010s. 
So transparency and holding people to account. Uh, Mariam, also, is there an issue of, of money here? There's only a finite, am finite amount of money and governments around the world have spent billions uh, trying to mitigate against, against, uh, mitigate against COVID. And is there a risk that if you spend loads of money on adaptation, it takes money away from some of those future technologies, ways of, of trying to get emissions down? I mean, I, I agree with Jerome, this is a both and. You're not going to be able to solve this problem if you only look at adaptation or you only look at reduction in emissions. And there are some solutions that amazingly will help us do both. So I think there's some real space here to be, you know, innovative and to think about things like, you know, insulating our homes help protect us against extreme weather, but it also helps reduce our energy consumption. And these things can be really effective. Uh, and Jerome, I'm just really interested to think, to hear what you think about public opinion in the States. They've been, it's been a, a terrible summer for America in terms of heat waves, wildfires, floods. Do you think that's changing people's minds on climate change? Um, well, even though I am a White House advisor, I was a climate activist beforehand. I climate strike for over 100 weeks in front of the White House. And I understand that right now the awareness is not there. The American media is, is sadly not like Sky News, where you guys break down the climate crisis. Our news is very much just talking about the hurricane, but not talking about the underlying issue that is the climate crisis. So I think that even though we have seen a rise in, in so much natural disasters from California to Florida to Louisiana and now New York City, people are not tying them together and understanding the broader system of climate change that is continuing to destabilize our communities. OK, we're going to move on to our next subject now, because as we heard earlier in the show, uh, British Airways has announced a new sustainability programme. But are plans for things like carbon offsetting and sustainable aviation fuel enough to help address the climate impact of flying? And, and Mariam, first of all, I'm just going to take our viewers over to show them how uh, much aviation contributes to global warming. Around 2.5 per cent of global carbon dioxide emissions from aviation. It doesn't sound like very much, but mile for mile, flying is the most damaging way to travel as far as the climate is concerned, isn't it? So should we just stop? I mean, we. I think the first thing to, to say is that obviously it does sound like a small number, but aviation is only going to grow. So it's obviously something that we need to pay attention to. But I, I definitely don't agree with that we should stop flying because I really believe that actually one of the most important things is that we need to have empathy across borders. And the only way we can do that is to go and meet and travel and be immersed in other cultures, other meet other people. And so this idea that we should have an isolationist solution just doesn't ring true for me. But I do think that you know, we need to invest in these technology solutions that really aren't quite there yet. And I think you saw that today with the announcement from BA. What do you, what do you make about technological solutions? Can we put our faith in them, Jerome? Can that, can that help us out of this conundrum? Hmm. Um, well, technological solutions have to first be able to reach market properly, um, because right now we're just seeing that Aviation companies are saying that, oh, they're, they're going to make small emissions reductions by a certain date. But right now, it's incredibly expensive and it isn't massively available. So right now, what we've seen that's already available is electric planes. They've already seen that in, in some parts of, of Maine and in, in Canada and some parts of the United States. And if we want to see massive, almost zero emissions from the get-go, then we need electric planes to, to be implemented. Uh, and, uh, Mariam, if, if it is agreed that we should fly less, there are certainly people calling for that. Should governments get involved in kind of disincentives, if you like? Should they be taxing the people that fly the most, for example? I mean, I do think looking at a carbon tax so that we know the true c cost of what we're doing is really important. But, I, you know, I don't think that um, limiting and blaming a family who's worked all year to be able to take a small holiday with their kids is really how we're going to solve the climate problem. I think we're looking here at big societal shifts and aviation has a lot of thinking to do because it is going to be one of the hardest ones to, to, to move. But I think it's okay. really about being thoughtful when you fly. OK, well, Marion Pasha, we are out of time. Thanks to you and thanks to Jerome Foster, too, joining us there from New York. Thanks very much indeed. Well, that's everything from us for today. On the show tomorrow, joining me to discuss the burning climate issues of the day will be Seppi golzari Munro from the Climate Intelligence Unit and Extinction Rebellion activist Chidi Oti Obihara. 
Do stay tuned now. Coming up next on Sky News tonight, Boris Johnson breaks two manifesto pledges with a tax rise to pay for social care and the suspension of the pension triple lock. More on that in a moment. But from me, thanks for watching. See you next time.